Hello friends, welcome to Smart Cat List. Today we'll be seeing the current affairs of 14 February 2019. The articles we'll be seeing for prelims are these eight. First article talks about the Indus Valley Civilization. The second article talks about the May Day in World's Third Pole. This is about the Himalayan ecosystem and the climate change stress that the ecosystem is facing. The third article is that 99% of the projects in forests get not. Fourth article talks about the state of electrification in four Indian states. And the fifth article is about E. Anudan initiative of Ministry of Social Justice and Welfare. Sixth article talks about the national policy on domestic workers. And the seventh one is about credit linked capital subsidy and technology upgradation scheme for MSME sector. And the final article for the day is E. Aushadi portal. The first article we'll be seeing is about Indus Valley Civilization. This article was taken from the paper The New Indian Express. This infographics it broadly speaks about the discoveries made in the ancient Indus Valley Civilization which spanned between 3000 to 1500 BC. So why this piece is in news? In the year 2015, a new Harappan site was excavated and the site is called as Rakhi Gargi and it is in the Indian state of Haryana. So the important discovery made from that excavation is that the people and the culture of Indus Valley civilization or the Harappan civilization is very very different from what which was prevailing in the beginning of Vedic civilization that is after 1500 BC. So this 3000 to 1500 BC that is the Indus Valley civilization period is a very important period in Indian history. This civilization is also called as proto-historic civilization and the people who lived and or even bronze civilization. This period is a period of first urbanization in India. The cities which are excavated belonging to this period, they are characterized as large cities with specialized craftsmanship, with surplus agriculture and even favorable balance of trade. Most of the settlements during this period were the settlements along the banks of the rivers, basically Indus. And it is also an indigenous civilization. People in the Indus Valley civilization were supposed to be living in peace and they were highly urbanized. Trade and commerce were flourishing, which is evident from many Persian and Mesopotamian seals which are discovered from this area. Cultivation of wheat, barley, etc. is found in many places like Lothal and Rangpur in Gujarat. Many other crops like dates, mustard and cotton were also produced during the IVC period. Art and crafts were also supposed to be flourishing in this period as there were many seals made up of a material called as titite, which is a soft stone is discovered from many Arappan sites. The Arappan city also had good sculptures as one of the very good example is the discovery of dancing doll which is made of dance was discovered in the city of Mohanjadaro and, it's, uh, and it dates back to about 2500 BCE. Different types of potteries were also discovered from many Harappan sites. One of the examples is Wheel of Life and the IVC people had an integral part of making pottery and the potteries were also painted. Sculptures were also famous during this period Both and terracotta was a very common material used during this period. Uh, one of the important sculpture is a sculpture of a priest king. This was found in Mohanjadaro and this is made of the same steatite stone. This article talks about some unfamiliar features of few Harappan cities which were discovered. So the first city we will be seeing is Roper. Roper is uh, in the Indian state of Haryana. This is where Roper is located. So this Roper is located in the left bank of river Satluj. These facts are very important for prelims and UPSC in many previous years has repeatedly been asking questions from the Harappan civilization. And Ropa is the lowest excavation ever in a Harappan site and it belonged to period 1 of the Harappan Valley civilization. The Harappan civilization is broadly classified into three phases, the early phase, the mature phase and the declining phase. And this uh, Ropa belonged to early phase of the proto-historic period. Apart from this, many terracotta beads and bangles which were worn by both men and women as well as sitite seals were uh, found in this place. Also, it is from Ropa, it was found that the Indus Valley civilization, the dead were buried with their head generally to north and with funerary vessels. The second site we will be seeing is Karanpura and the Karanpura is located in the state of Rajasthan. So in Karanpura there are many potteries found and the city is expected to be from the period 3300 
to 2600 BC. So it spanned both to early Harappan as well as mature Harappan period. So apart from the pottery, many jewelries and the skeleton of a child was also discovered from this current pura in the year 2013. Third site we'll be seeing is Raki Gargi in the state of Haryana. So here it is well located, and this belonged to 6500 BC. And so, which means that this is a pre-Harappan site. This site is located in Gagar Harakka River Plain. As I said before, many of the states in this period are located in the river banks. So, Ropar was located in Satluj Bank, and this state is located in Harakka River Basin Plain. And this Raki Gargi has unique, well-planned city with urbanized sewage system connecting every household. The next city we'll be seeing is Babur North, and this city is located in the state of Gujarat. So Babur North, uh, it is located in Saurashtra region and it belonged to late Harappan period around 1500 BC. And in this place, a uh, stone fortification wall was present. So fortification is basically used to, to protect the city. And there's also findings of agriculture that is plant remains of millets, gram and bajra was discovered from Babur court in Gujarat. The next city we'll be seeing is Alamgirpur. Alamgirpur is in the state of Uttar Pradesh, and it is the easternmost excavated Harappan site, and it belonged to 3300 to 1300 BC. And in this place, many Harappan excavations were made, belong like beads, craft, as well as many roof tiles. So from this, we can infer that Harappan civilization had some unique features like proper town planning, proper water reservoirs, and fortified walls. There were even temples and religious places like the priest king sculpture. They used a standardized form of measurements, which can be inferred from the seals. They had a practice of burying the dead, uh, which is found from the city of Ropar. They had pottery and wheels for both agriculture as well as decoration, and they had a very sophisticated undeciphered script, which is not deciphered till today. The second article we'll be seeing is May Day in World's Third Pole. This article was taken from the newspaper Mint, and this article talks about the effects of climate change in the Himalayan ecosystem and how the biodiversity in the region will be affected because of that. We all know that Himalayan region is a ecologically sensitive zone, and it is said that Himalayan region already lost 15% of its glaciers since 1970s. And if this rate of global warming and climate change continues, it will lose about 15 to 20% more by 2100. In this situation, about 90% of the snow in this region, which is currently there, will permanently disappear. So this calls for serious climate action. So if the glaciers melt, then the water levels will increase, and the perennial rivers in our country, like Indus and Ganga, whose source of river lies in the Himalayan glaciers, will have continuous supply of water. And this will definitely increase the water level, and this will result in greater amount of disasters like floods. And this floods can even trigger other disasters like landslides. We all know about the uh, glacial lake burst disaster, which occurred in Uttarakhand in the year 2013. And more of those kind of disasters can be prevalent if this climate change in Himalayan region is not stopped. So here are some facts about this world's third pole, that is Himalayan region, and it's also world's most vulnerable region to climate change after North and Southern poles. So the total area of this Hindu Kush Himalayas is about 4.2 million square kilometer, and it spans along many countries, including India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, Nepal, Bhutan, as well as Myanmar and Bangladesh. So totally, it spans around eight countries. And there are many river basins located in this area. So some of the important rivers, apart from Ganga and Indus, include Amur Darya, Brahmaputra, Airavadi, Maikon, Salvin, Tarim, Yangtze, and the Yellow River. So all these rivers they derive the uh, their water from the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. So this is the importance of this uh, region. So a whole new ecosystem is dependent on this Hindu Kush Himalayan region, and it is to be emphasized that many world level bodies have recognized the importance of this region, and this region is one of the ecologically sensitive biodiversity global hotspots. So four global hotspots are located in this uh, Hindu Kush Himalayan region, and it has about thirty five thousand plant species and two hundred plus animal species. 
So India has taken many steps to protect this uh, sensitive ecosystem. We have National Action Plan for Climate Change which has a specific program dedicated to protection of the Himalayan ecosystem. So more such plans and more public action is required in order to protect this vulnerable region from climate change. The third article for the day is taken from the newspaper Hindu. 99.8% projects get in forests get not from the apex body National Board for Wildlife. So we all know that in our country, the National Board for Wildlife is the highest authority which will give permission for building any industry or infrastructure project out of the forest land. So the concerning fact here is that in the past five years alone, this National Board for Wildlife has cleared 682 projects and only five projects were rejected. So which means that more forest land and protected areas are diverted for clearance and industrial building which means that a huge number of biodiversity is under threat. So for the prelims, you have to know about the importance of the forest and the biodiversity in the forest and the need to protect it. You can link it with the other topics such as climate change. And you also have to know about the National Board for Wildlife. So National Board for Wildlife is currently a statutory body. This statutory body is established under Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So previously in the year 1952 itself, the Indian Board for Wildlife was constituted under the chairmanship of Prime Minister. But after the increasing climate awareness in 1970s and the concept of sustainable development, in the year 1972, the Wildlife Protection Act was passed and this body was made as a statutory body under the Wildlife Protection Act. So currently the body National Board for Wildlife is chaired by the Prime Minister and it includes 47 members. So out of the 42 members, 19 members are ex officio members. The other members include members from Lok Sabha as well as Rajya Sabha, members from NGOs and prominent ecologists and conservationists. So it is important that this body is inclusive. It should not just have political members but also significant ecologists, conservationists as well as environmentalists. However, the problem here is that Currently, the body which is supposed to have 10 eminent ecologists, it currently has only 2 and out of 5 NGOs, it only has 1. So, this seriously affects the balance of functioning of this organization which can in turn affect the balance of the ecosystem. The primary function of the board is to promote conservation as well as development of wildlife and forest and this body has the power to review all wildlife related matters and approve all the projects in and around the protected areas such as national park and wildlife sanctuaries. Though this body is just an uh, advisory body, no alteration of boundaries of the national park and the wildlife sanctuaries can be made without the approval of National Board for Wildlife. The next article we will be seeing is, only 84% of the rural households have electricity in 4 states. We know electricity is very important for development and this article talks about the loopholes in the existing rural electrification schemes in our country. So in the year 2017, the central government it launched a scheme called as Saubhagya scheme. So the Saubhagya scheme is also called as Pradhan Mandri Sahaj Bijili Har Gar Yojana. So it offers 100% electricity connection to all the households in our country. This scheme covers both rural as well as urban areas covering all the states in our country. The beneficiaries of the scheme will be identified from socio-economic caste census of 2011 and unelectrified households and these unelectrified households will be provided electricity connection. And according to the government's data on the Sobagya scheme, 100% electrification of households has been achieved in the states of UP, Bihar, Odisha and Rajasthan. However, the recently released data of Smart Power India, it states that only 84% of the rural households have been electrified in the states of UP, Bihar, Rajasthan and Odisha. So this is because of the gap between supply and demand. Though the availability rate is high, the access rate that is the actual rate at which electricity is used by the households is very less. The report also found that only 75% of the households used electricity from grid. Which means that in several households in these four states are depending upon off-grid sources of electricity. The main reason for this gap according to this survey is that the people though they had electricity connection, they could not afford to use it. 
So we all know the importance of electricity. So uh, improving electricity connection will have its drop down effect in other areas like uh, better education, better health. It will increase the connectivity via radio and television, mobiles etc. In turn all these will increase the economic activities and thus it will create more jobs thus finally producing increased quality of life. So such a drop down effect is possible only if this supply demand gap is addressed in all the states of our country. The next article is about E Anudan. This is an initiative of Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment and this was taken from PIB. So this scheme basically targets to prevent alcoholism and substance abuse. So according to WHO, the alcoholism and substance abuse is increasing not just in developed but also in developing countries at a high rate. This is associated with several uh, surveys also associate this with increasing stress levels especially among the youth. So the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment has rolled out an integrated program to prevent this alcoholism and substance abuse. This scheme also has an integrated program for old persons to bring them out of alcoholism. Deen Dayal Disabled Rehabilitation Scheme will be rolled out to promote voluntary action for persons with disabilities. There will also be special assistance for fitting aids and applicants for disabled people and free coaching will also be provided for uh, vulnerable sessions like SC as well as OBC students. So all these will bring in inclusiveness to bring in an overall improvement and overall development of our country. The sixth article we'll be seeing is about national policy for domestic workers. So this is taken from PIB. And this national policy is mainly enacted to prevent the exploitation and abuse of the unorganized sector domestic workers. Till today, in our country, there is no separate law or any policy for the interest of domestic workers. However, we all know that about 3.9 million people in our country are employed as domestic workers and predominantly most of them are women. So in order to guarantee protection to these people uh, and prevent them from sexual abuse, and exploitation. This exploitation can be both economical exploitation or social exploitation. Ministry of Labor and Employment is considering to formulate a new policy called as national policy for domestic workers and this policy is now in draft stage. Now we will see the salient features of the policy. So under this policy inclusion of domestic workers under current present acts will be made possible. And domestic workers will have right to register as unorganized workers so that many schemes like for social security for the unorganized sector workers can be accessed and the benefits can be reaped by the domestic workers. So uh, under this policy the domestic workers will also have the right to form their own associations and unions and they will also be guaranteed right to minimum wages and access to social security like insurance schemes. They will also be awarded safer working conditions which is very much essential especially for working mothers. There will be more avenues to enhance the skills of the workers and in case of any abuse or exploitation they will also have access to courts and grievance addressal mechanism will also be provided. So already for unorganized sector there is unorganized sector social security act is in place and it provides social security for all unorganized workers including the domestic workers. And the government is also planning to constitute state domestic workers board under the state governments to protect the rights of the domestic workers. The seventh article for the day is about the credit linked subsidy scheme and the technology upgradation scheme for the MSME sector. This article was also taken from PIB. So the major objectives of bringing in this scheme is to offer tech upgradation for the MSME sector. As we are in 21st century with fourth industrial revolution happening with more automation and technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence and blockchains coming in, it is very important for the MSME sectors to stay updated technologically. So this scheme will facilitate technology upgradation in MSMEs by providing capital upfront. So under this capital upfront, a subsidy of about 15% will be provided on institutional finance of up to 1 crore rupees for the MSMEs. This will help in upgradation of the plant machinery with state of art technology. So we all know that MSME sector is a backbone of Indian economy. They not just contribute uh, to our GDP, but also most of our exports from our country 
is by the MSME sector. So apart from increasing the technology, this will in turn help to increase the competitiveness of the MSME sector. The Indian MSMEs will be able to compete with the global industries. Many interventions such as zero defect and zero effect manufacturing will increase the efficiency and productivity will be brought in. Design intervention as well as cloud computing will be introduced and facilitation of intellectual property and incubation centers will be made available under this technology upgradation scheme. The final article for the day is a new portal called as e Shidi portal. This article was also taken from PIB. So, Ministry of Ayush has launched this new portal called as e Ayush Dhani portal and under this e Ayush Dhani portal, uh, online availability of licensed drugs will be available for traditional medicines in Ayurveda, Siddha, Unani and Homeopathy. So we all know that there is yet another existing portal called as Jan Ayush Jani portal. So this portal is under the Ministry of Chemicals and Department of Pharmaceuticals. This will make available the genetic drugs. And this is a different portal under Ministry of Ayush. So by creating this portal, there will be increased the transparency. There will also be increased the flow of information and the availability of medicines and increased accountability will also be there. This will help establishing good governance. Apart from this, real-time information on the available drugs, the cancelled drugs and the spurious drugs will also be provided in the website. Thank you.